and um, just a little bit of a disclaimer for those of you who are um, new to the RSP film room, just want to let you know that the videos posted here at the RSP film room are not hosted on this server and the original video content is not considered the property of the RSP film room. The videos are considered to be used under the Fair Use Doctrine of the United States Copyright Law, Title 17, U.S. Code Sections 107 through 118, and the videos are used on this site for editorial and educational purposes only. We're watching cut-ups of players between five and ten minutes long, talking about what we see to evaluate and educate each other as well as our audience. Um, and we do not claim any ownership of any of the original video content, and the RSP Film Room and its staff of one and this furball here, do not use said video clips in advertisements, marketing, or for direct financial gain, and all video content in each clip is considered owned by the individual broadcast companies. So with that mouthful out of the way, welcome to the RSP Film Room, episode number 40. And number 40 is not for the age of my um, guest today, whose birthday is this evening, so it is my distinct honor to have... Kyle Krabs here from NDT Scouting, who also does work over at Draft Breakdown. It's just awesome to be able to share a birthday with someone who's like, I want to I want to spend the day, I want to spend part of my birthday breaking down film in the RSB film room. So Kyle, it's an esteemed pleasure to have you and welcome. Thanks for joining me. Oh, anytime. You know, it's this is what it's all about. So we're we're getting down to the nitty-gritty of the the draft evaluation process, and I know I personally have had everything dusted off for a while, so it'll be nice to uh, you know, go back over some games with a fine tooth brush and, and see what kind of fun details we can dig out tonight. Oh, absolutely, and we're going to get a good chance to, to dig out some details tonight with who is arguably, in many circles, the top tight end in this draft class, one Max Williams of Minnesota, um, not to be mistaken with the illustrious Josh Norris, who we've joked around as being his lookalike for um, several months now. Um, if I had had time this afternoon, I might have posted a, a little split screen to show you guys just how alike they actually look. Um, at least in the face. So, um, with that said, you know, Kyle. Kyle suggested Williams as one of the possibilities that we would watch today. What was it about him that you felt like would be a, you know, an enjoyable film session for something like this? Well, I really think he's an an interesting study as far as the, he's not, not his athletic profile does not really pop off the page at you. Uh, he has special talents as far as. Uh, ball skills and, and with the ball in his hands, uh, he has some special abilities. Um, but I think there's also uh, some things that we'll look at tonight that you know will raise some questions as far as you know, what's this transition early on for him. Uh, I think he he has the the potentials through the roof, uh, but some teams I think if you look at the total package. There might be some questions that, that we can touch on and see, uh, is this things that you know raise red flags? It, it might keep him from being a contributor significantly early, a la Eric Ebron last year. Uh, so I think it, he's just really interesting weighing the potential uh, ceiling for a player versus what you're getting as a year one package. That's an, that's, an, that's an excellent way of putting it and framing what we're going to be doing this evening. Um, and Kyle was a, a tight end and a defensive end. That's what he told me off, offline just now because it's the first time we've had a chance to talk. Um, and so I was wondering if you could share with folks a little bit more about um, – you know, how you got into this and, you know, why you enjoy it the way that you do. And I would recommend everyone, seriously, go check out ndtscouting.com. Um, he has a wealth of work there that I would recommend. Um, and I, I think that you would, you know, it would be beneficial to anybody who's a draft, Nick, um, to, to, to visit there and take a look at a lot of the, the great work that he's doing. Well, I got, I got my start. Um, I played tight end and defensive end, as, as mentioned, in high school. I uh, got hurt my senior year, never really got the chance to pursue uh, playing on the collegiate level. I was interested in walking on at Indiana University, Pennsylvania, um, but getting hurt, it kind of threw a wrench. Nobody wants a 160-pound uh, defensive end walking on campus. So uh, I eventually just ended up going to Penn State University and um, 
from there, I had the opportunity to do a little bit of coaching and just balancing coaching, the demands, the time, and uh, my classes. It, it just got to be too much. So the next natural phase in my evolution of staying engaged with the game was getting into talent evaluation. And it's something I have did casually for a couple of years. And the last couple, I've been very fortunate enough to have the time available to really pursue this and, and start to build momentum with what I'm doing over at NDT. So what are some of the things that you look for in a tight end that you feel like are um, important things for anyone who is just getting the chance to start studying film? Um, what, you know, what are some of the things that you find valuable in, in looking at the tight end position or things that you would say are worth keeping in mind? I really appreciate um, those who show the ability to uh, sift their way through traffic well, uh, being a traditional... Um, in-line receiver, potentially being flexed in the slot. You know, you're still, if you're working in the middle of the field, um, no, 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 be encountering a lot of bodies. So the ability to be effective slipping past that body on the second level that might be trying to disrupt your release up the seam or something like that, uh, I, that that's one thing I certainly key on as a receiver. Uh, the ability to extend hands back and attack the football in the air uh, is something that, you know, I think is very important when you're working, again, as a middle-of-the-field receiver. And then just the, the blocking fundamentals really stand out to me, getting your head on the right side of blocks, um, being able to not just catch a block but establish contact and, and stun with your hands. Uh, those are things that, that I really look for and I really covet when it comes to blocking because... Uh, if you're just a flex guy, unless you're Jimmy Graham and you're a really special talent, you need to at least be able to control guys on the second level and win with your blocks, with your hands. Yeah, and I think that that's an, a very important point is to talk about the fact that the, the less versatile you are, you better have some very special abilities to compensate for that lack of versatility that is demanding for in most ways of that position, that the position demands a great deal of versatility. Excuse me, versatility. And uh, if you don't have it, you better be absolutely fantastic in one specific area that can make you a game changer. So, with that in mind, for those of you who are rather new to the RSP film room, um, this is just two guys watching tape and studying what we see. Um, commenting on it. There's going to be dead air at times between things. We're going to be rewinding and replaying um, portions of the tape at times. If When we can slow down tape, we'll do that. And we'll talk about what we see at the position, what we see specifically about that player, as well as just overall trends with either evaluation or the game itself. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the, um, the, the screen of the highlights, cut-ups that we're going to be watching, which are from Draft Breakdown, which um, both <laughs> Kyle and I, um, I would say, are very appreciative of Draft Breakdown and the work that they do, as well as m so many other people in the draft community. They are just a fantastic resource um, and, a, and a group that is just headed by a, a staff of writers who, you know, who I would say are very engaging, um, do in-depth work, and realize this as a look at this as a community as a whole and are very encouraging of making this a community. So, you know, big shout out to them. So, Kyle, can you see the screen that I've got up here? I can, yep. Okay, good deal. Then I'm going to lock this in and I'm going to see if we can get Max Williams set up here, turn down the volume, and we should be good to go. All right, let's get this thing rolling. And I think right there you see evidence of a player who at least, at the very least, um, is willing to attack, as you said, you know, on the on a particular play like this. Let's see if I can get it to... Rewinding might be a little difficult on this particular thing, but we'll give it a shot. It's not exactly stunning with his hands on that particular play. But right. He's... And it, it's um, it's not an established stun, like you said, but he's at least making an effort to get him inside the quote-unquote strike zone where he's in on the armpits a little bit. He's not 
way out on top of pads, and he's not just throwing a single out hand out there and trying to grab. He's trying to throw both hands simultaneously and establish on a moving target. Absolutely, and he does get good position to start with so that he can get there. And that's and oftentimes that's that's you know just the the basic fundamental thing that you're looking for with a lot of these guys, especially if they're playing on the wing or they may be considered a move tight end to begin with. Um, and certainly Williams, I mean, what do you think about his size? Do you look at this guy and say he's strictly a move tight end, or do you see him as someone that has that potential to grow into more of an inline player? I certainly think he has the potential to grow into it. Uh, I think where he is right now, um, his film speaks really well to uh, what his skill set lends itself to. Minnesota used him a lot as a flex guy, as an H-back that they move across the set, uh, like they're kind of doing here where he's folding up underneath and trying to get a seal block on the inside on one of those linebackers. Um, so he, he's not really utilized at a very high frequency as an inline guy. But I think if you give him the opportunity to really add some polish and, you know, it's really hyperbole to say, oh, add upper body strength or add functional strength. But if he's able to do that, I don't see any reason why he couldn't at least put his hand in the dirt and contribute in some reps there as well. Makes sense. And, I mean, when you look, when you look at a player, you know, I was asked this earlier today, how do you look at a player and determine whether he his body's maxed out or whether he has room to add his add weight or not? What are you looking for in a player to, to say where, where he can add weight and not add weight? Uh, I, I tend to look at the base of a player, how thick he is in the lower half, um, and, and the torso that extends upwards into the torso. Uh, if a guy's got real wide hips, uh, but they, they get skinnier and they, it narrows as you get further up towards the shoulders, um, you know, typically that's a player that has a little bit of room to grow. Um, but I, I believe I saw you answer this question, and I thought you did a really nice job saying, unless you have access to strength and conditioning individuals that have ties to the player, uh, it's really hard to place specifically where he is. Yeah, and it's, you know, I often put in, I often put in some of my analysis you know, that he, I think a player looks maxed out and, and talk about that. And it's kind of funny because I felt like today as I wrote that, I was like, I'm kind of indicting myself along with everyone else <laughs> who does this. But I, it was the truth, you know. It's just like, look, I, unless I know. Because, I mean, we I had uh, Chad Spann on here recently, the running back from uh, NIU, former running back from NIU, and we were talking about Amir Abdullah. And he was telling me how he thought Abdullah could add weight. You know, I'll go on another show and talk to a guy like Cecil Lammy and tell him that, and he'll be like, you know, we saw him at a senior bowl. He doesn't look like he could add an ounce of weight onto right. him. But I'm asking Chad that, and Chad's like, I've seen him. You you look at his at his abs and his waist, and you can see it in his waist where he can add it. And I'm like, well, he's a running back. He was about the same size, right? and he's done a lot of training with other guys. He helped train David Cobb over the summer um, and work with him, and I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, there you have it, because I mean, otherwise, I would look at it from the naked eye and have the same thing. But I would look at a guy like Williams, and I would estimate the same thing. You look at that, like you said, you know, his lower body, his lower body looks pretty filled out here from his thighs to his hips, but that upper body does look like he could add a little bit more weight, maybe in his core and his upper back and 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 chest the area and his abs, and maybe in your abs you can generate a little bit more explosion when you add that weight, um, but. You know, we're talking maybe 10 pounds, you know, 10, 15 pounds. Yeah, I don't think he's a guy that you could bulk up to 265 and, and ask him to be anything near what he is now. Ideally, maybe 5 to 10 pounds and just hope that, you know, the, the lean muscle mass that he adds, uh, he's able to add some explosion. But I, I certainly think with where he does well as a player, I think it would be misguided to ask him to bulk up into, say, Austin Safarian Jenkins territory from last year when he was playing at Washington. Absolutely, and that's a terrific point because you want a player, you want a player to, you want to enhance what the player does, not remake him into something that he might not be able to be. Right. Unless he's just that low on your totem pole in terms of, like, he might not make the team otherwise – then you're not drafting a guy in the first round anyway or in the early rounds, and you're just saying, well, you, you'd have to remake your game to make this team in the first place, and Williams certainly isn't that guy. 
it's, you know, that might have been one of the better blocks that I saw him make in all three games that I've watched on Draft Breakdown. That ability to stick that left foot in the ground and get those shoulders turned at such a steep angle and catch that shooting defender, that's a really, really nice job. Yeah, I agree. It's a very underrated play because this is very hard to set up and get a position like this where you're you're actually running inside to set up an outside seal like that. Yeah. That just that that gives you a good indication of how he can gauge in the open field and that's important. Yep. Now there we kind of saw um, with the hands that was almost that almost felt like a catch with the hands. He does a really nice job navigating the traffic because on that peel block inside, um, it would have been pretty easy for him to run outside of that that initial offensive lineman that was back in the backfield. Um, but he did a nice job stopping and cutting up underneath a 73 on the pulling guard. And he's in a great position, but I I don't see the linebacker or that defender's pads when he contacts him. There's no impact that I really saw on that. It's just kind of he just kind of places there. Yeah, and it's good hand placement, but that's why he doesn't generate drive and he doesn't really take control of this block. He just kind of attaches on. Yeah, and I think that some of that is when we see. I keep missing the the play here, but hopefully we'll get it right here. Okay, here we go. I think one of the things, like for this particular play, just individually, you know, his feet are off the ground, maybe not completely stuck into the ground. They are a little bit here, but he's got that wide base. Right. And that wide base isn't going to help you deliver that kind of power that you need. But it's enough of a pop at the right time. It's kind mm -hmm. of just a little jab with timing. And he has a lot of those where it's more or less, you know, the, either the ball carrier is doing a nice job cutting off of his hip and it's just the ball carrier sets up the block well enough that Williams is just, I don't want to say in the way, but he's in position where he's able to stave off the defender from making the play. Yeah, just like this play here. I mean, that's another example of that where he's, he's doing his job just enough, but he's not going to dominate the guy. And if you're looking at a wing back here, a guy playing wing or maybe fullback occasionally, you can see how he would he might still be of use to a team right away at this level if he can do some of the same things in the NFL. But to become a player that they can't take off the field, yet you're going to be looking for someone who can deliver more of a punch and do it from an inline spot. Right, and that that goes exactly back to what we talked about, filling out frames and things like that. Um, just a little bit more explosive power where you know, if he doesn't have his feet set, he still might be able to establish a punch and really establish a block yeah. if he's able to add a little bit more pop in those hands. Yeah, right now he's pesky. You know, he's a he's a this is a, an example of a pesky block. You know, it's like, all right, heads down a little bit. You'd like to see that up a little bit. But, I mean, he keeps his feet moving. Yep. He's staying locked on. He's certainly turning and moving with the man. You know, the effort's there. No, efforts this effort's certainly not a problem. This is what this is what we're really looking at for this guy. And, and Minnesota hung him out to dry a couple times in this game, as we'll see, with those those uh, fold flat routes underneath with that scrape into the flat and by the time he's getting the ball and getting his head around, he's got a guy in his legs a couple of times. So um it, Yeah. We'll get into that. Yeah, absolutely. But even here, where we haven't seen anything that we would say this makes him a great prospect in terms of like plays that he's made, what you see right off the bat is anyone who's new to watching film is you're seeing a fluid athlete. You know, he, he's quick enough. He seems to adjust and stop and start and turn very well. Um, he, you know, he doesn't show great functional strength, but it's enough to get the job done right now. And he seems to be, you know, and the team trusts to move him around the formation and use him as a lead blocker in a lot of situations. Now, and, flexed. 
Yeah, which is a you know again nice value here if when you're looking for something effective there. Never really got on top of him, but that's not you're not asking him to win as a as a flanker. No, flexed out like that, you can't expect him to get over top of coverage like that. No, you're hoping when you've. I would imagine that when and tell me if you disagree, but I would think that when you flex a player like Max Williams outside, what you're looking for hopefully is to generate a mismatch somewhere else or an adjustment where he ends up being the mismatch um, player. And in that case, he wasn't. You know, he wasn't in that situation. Right. If if you get a linebacker and press on him, then then maybe he becomes a primary on on a hot. Or something like that. But if they're not going to adjust their defense, if they're playing zone and they're not letting you dictate matchups, um, then you just know, okay, we got size on the perimeter. Uh, where do we have speed on the inside against somebody that's a little bit slower that we can take advantage of? Yeah. And here, I mean, this is another example. This is what you would expect from a, from a wing back playing in line is you're going to help double team with the tackle or the second tight end. He does a nice job really helping collapse that. You know, anytime you're the second guy on impact, uh, that's all you can ask for is being able to just collapse that edge down a little bit and shorten that angle. Yep. So now in the, now we have him in the slot. Gets a nice release inside or outside. Yeah, we all know this one. Yeah. Oh, you got one too. I do. Yeah, he's, he's real talkative tonight. <laughs> it's a fine play. And and I won't. I don't want to harp too much on, you know, the sideline awareness because you know once you go up like that, you're naturally going to try and just drag the foot behind. For me, what really stands out there is the body control to be able to put the torso on such a steep angle, and still be able to keep the feet down. Yeah. I mean that's just outstanding. Yeah. And and it's one of those things that I mean again, you to me, I look at the sideline awareness and I say it's good even if he didn't get both feet in cuz you know, we often talk about projecting towards the NFL game. And and so the NFL game is yeah, two feet in bounds is what you need to have. But you know, you can even see from the get-go that on the replay here that even the way that he moves his feet, he's aware. He's trying to drag this first foot and that inside yep. foot. Yep. And as he's reaching for the ball. So, I mean, you know he knows that, and he's trying to do it. It's just this play he, he's unable to. Could you go back to the release on that one? Yeah. When you see him get... Did, did you notice how he kind of tilted the shoulders a little bit running by that linebacker? Yeah. That goes back to the, the first thing I mentioned was with being able to navigate in traffic. And that's a really nice job minimizing impact on the second level and getting over top of the linebacker in zone. Yeah. That's a really, really, really nice job. That's a nice point. And you look at – and I'm, I'm a big proponent of watching the player's hips and what they're doing there and how you use the hips. And in this situation, you're looking at – Tilting the shoulder, but he's also helping himself out by driving through. Yep. And accelerating. And he even gives a little bit of a nod or a hesitation as if he's might be going inside just enough. So he sets up the safety a bit. And just how much depth he got after being hip to hit with 37. You know, when the when the camera pans, you don't expect him to be at the 22, 23 yard line. Not remotely. Because he's out of the frame for, what, a split second? And, yeah. and he's 10 yards down the field. Yeah, and he's got, he's got six to seven yards on the defender as the ball arrives. And 13, I mean, 13 was held just enough on that, that move at the top of the stem. Yep. It wasn't even really a move. It was just kind of a little bit of a hesitation and, and look. Sometimes all it takes is to keep the head inside, to turn inside to look at it. Yep. Can, it, you know, they talk about quarterbacks controlling defenders with his eyes, but, you know, sometimes on these against zone defenses, it's just as much for receivers. You know, they're, they're looking for that too. They're yeah. looking for any tip-off that they can get to try and get a break on it. 
this is another nice play, I think, in the sense of it's not perfect. There's there's work to be done technically. But again, when you look at the fact that here's you know efforts there. When a guy's got his hips bent like this and he's trying to explode through contact, right. this does help him drive the defender back and get his hands on it. Now, a better defender might have been able to shed him immediately and been more aware, but again, you're seeing you're seeing someone who wants to you know, who wants to engage and relishes that engagement and that's something that you can add on to as something projectable. He may not ever be a great blocker, but you know he's always going to be willing. Well, and even just the effort that went into trying to get his head around on the outside shoulder, and the, you know he was able to generate a little bit of torque with the shoulders. Uh, I it, it looks like he really uh, reaches with that left hand and, and applies pressure with that outside hand to really work his body across. Now granted it comes after the back kind of breaks down a little bit but that effort and willingness and awareness to try and get the body in a correct position is a plus even if the actual result of the block itself is only adequate. Yeah and again you know we're speaking each other's language here and if you haven't thought about it we're talking what we're really talking about here is that sometimes the process is more important than the result when you're evaluating a player at this stage. Absolutely. It's like the math problem at the board you know you may not you may not get the answer right but a good teacher is probably going to give you partial credit if you Show get your some, work. showing your work and several of the steps are are correct and you're on your way and you can't let him release that easy off the snap but that's a really nice uh, it looked like he took a nice lateral step right off the line of scrimmage immediately on release uh, to help uncover from that uh, defensive lineman that was lined up across from him right on the snap. Yeah, let's see this one more time here. I apologize for my uh, my great editing skills at this point, but we'll or directing skills on this, but sometimes that happens. Here we go. Yep. See, first step was the left, just to get width, and then he's outside shoulder or inside shoulder to outside shoulder. The lineman uh, doesn't really get a chance to get his hands on him and jam his release off the line. Um, and then he just eats up cushion here as he gets on top. Yeah. Let's see if we can see it more time here. I even like... Let's see if we can get it here one more time. All right. I even like what he does here at the top of the stem because he get, yep. he, he plays up this defender getting him to, to think outside and then is late enough with hanging, you know, keeping the stem, selling it to the outside before then finally getting the man's hips to turn and, and getting inside. Well, it looked like he cleared with his forearm too at the top just to really make sure that there was no contact and he was able to carry his momentum through his break and really stay clean uh, with yeah. the, the defender's hips flipped. All right, one more time here. Here we go. First lateral step to get wide, as you mentioned. Gets upfield. Has his, you can see the hips turn. Look at the hips, knees, and feet, and the shoulders all angling outside. That you, you know, as a defensive back, you have to be pretty darn patient not to react to that. Yep, because that screams uh, corner the whole way. Absolutely, and once he see once the man's hips are turned and he sells out a couple more steps, now you see the arm and that work inside. Yeah, really nice route subtleties there. It's a pretty nice fit, his initial fit on that block. Absolutely. Gets that outside shoulder and turns him right in, and he uses his hands very well. It's not just the strike. Yep. He rides that all the way down in.
and this is the other thing I I really do think he's pretty good out in space and some of the better blockers you see at this position aren't always as good out in space as he is he's very patient with getting his depth outside and then turning up field to to face his man like right allowing pursuit angles to be worked to his advantage and, and allowing the pursuit to collapse into him as compared to you know trying to chase to the spot and then by that time the flow of the defender has taken him away from having an advantageous angle excellent yeah excellent explanation of that and here you're going to see it one more time once we get done with this particular play we'll see it if I Oh, I must have missed it. Let's see. I think it's this next one. Yeah, it might be. No, not this one yet. Might be the one after. All right. Here we go. Watch 41 come to him first. Right? Breaking inside here. Yep. Two steps, and then he finally turns after that second step. And the way he sets that up is back is to the ball carrier. Um, and, and that's a nice way to frame blocks, is to know wherever you're protecting, if your back numbers are facing directly to him and you're directly between the ball carrier and the defender that you're responsible for on any given play, you're in excellent position because now that defender can't just run. You physically can't run straight through somebody. You're going to have to either shed the block or run around them and take the potential of risking running yourself out of the play. Excellent point. And again, even something like that play here, I just really like the effort. You know, you... He doesn't know whether this play is going to break open or not. But what you see with him, and I mean, this is the, we're going to see that same play again in a minute, but the next play after this, you're going to see him run all the way down the field here, and it's not just a jog. I mean, he is... Yeah, he's, he's hauling butt the whole way. Yeah. There you, now you're talking. That's ball skills. Yeah. And he's comfortable. I mean he splits the he splits the linebacker and the defender and the defensive back, looking the ball all the way in. He's he's not really phased by either body. You know, he's there's that's a tight window to to run through and he's really not knocked off course at all by either guy. Yep. And then to extend past that and attack the ball way out away from his frame like he does. It's it's a great catch. Yep, and there's both feet in bounds. One thing I, I think one thing that's a really nice hallmark of his game is that he's consistent. I think he's a I think he's a fairly consistent player. You know what game to game from watching him I felt like I knew what I was going to see from him. Mm -hmm. And you know that comes back to uh, not just box score scouting because there were a couple games where he was only limited to a handful of catches but uh, there's he had a lot more opportunities than he actually cashed in with in catches, and you have to figure you get him in an upgraded offense with uh, a couple more versatile players around him as skill players and an NFL quarterback, and the potential is there as a receiver to be uh, a much more consistent threat than he was at Minnesota. Yeah, because even that red zone play we saw just a, a minute earlier where he splits the two defenders in this at the goal line and gets it back here his confidence on that says a lot about what he's going to be able to do in tight coverage and tight windows the quarterback was throwing merely to a spot behind that so it wasn't as difficult of a throw as it was um, 
a route and catch. Right. And, and so for a more advanced quarterback, you're going to see more daring throws than that one there. Another nice, fairly patient play there. Yep. That one I felt he could have taken a better angle on. Um, coming across the set, he kind of came across flat. Um, as he collapses back across, and now his outside shoulder right here. Yeah, his adjustment, you kind of saw him shuffle step across is what it was. Yeah. And um, he, he caught himself hopping, and, and it's difficult to redirect like that with, without both feet on the ground. Absolutely. That's one way to collapse the edge. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he doesn't hold back on this one. No. Again, he's willing to be physical, and he's willing to throw his body around, not just as a receiver, and that's... That's an admirable play. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't call that reckless. I think he's. I think he knows how to use his body. Well, and you you can see a little bit more confidence with how much power he's putting, like how much he's putting his body into his blocks. If he knows that, I mean, that's two plays in the last three where, if he knows that somebody else, somebody squared up with somebody else and he's stacked, you know, he he looks for a kill shot and he's looking to earhole you. Yeah. And I admire that if you're a blocker and you get the chance to put somebody on their back, go for it. Absolutely. And these are little things. I mean, this is away from the play. But willingness to use his hands and not get tied up. I mean, these are... Let me see if I can... All right, let's not get bogged down here. There we go. Try one more time. All right, let's see if this is it. Just a little chop here on the on the arm, but that's. I mean, again, you want to see how willing a player is going to use his hands, and you know those are little things you look for oftentimes on on these tapes with releases, whether he's the target or not. Right, and I'm not reading so much into like we did before that the separation necessarily wasn't there. It's you know if he's willing to use that chop on a perimeter corner, you know, if he's using it against a linebacker or a safety that's walked up, uh, he's, show, he's showing that he has a fundamental skill that he's capable of winning a clean release uh, if he's flexed in the slot as compared to being a flanker and trying to win with it that way. Absolutely. And again, they you know they know how to use Williams well enough that you understand basically what you know how he can be used to be a an effective blocker in their offense. So in a you know maybe in a different offense we're going to be looking at a player who you know if they draft him they're like we want him to bulk up a little bit, we want to have him play in line. They may project that he can do that, but it may take him a little bit more time, as you alluded to um, earlier in the show here. So uh, this next game, I think we're going to watch. If we got time, you got a little bit more time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right, then we'll watch a little. We'll watch this Missouri game and check out a little bit more of what we can get from Mr. Williams. We got him up top in the slot. 
And we'll never know if he was open or not. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But again, nice job moving his feet. You know, that's the big thing is you get your, once you get your hands on a guy as a blocker, just keep those feet moving and driving. Yeah, and anytime you're on the perimeter, I was always taught if you're on the perimeter and you can get your shoulders perpendicular to the defender's shoulders at the point of attack, I mean, you've won the snap immediately. So when you read 88 right there, uh, edge is sealed, and it, it's impossible for that player unless – the defender is able to get enough penetration to shoot upfield and be able to squeeze that angle tightly enough to catch the running back receiving the football. I mean, there's no way he's impacting this play. Yeah. Nice. Of those move flats. Yeah. But I like how he, I, again, this is a, this is some of these balls. I mean, I wouldn't say that they're difficult catches, but when I see tight ends drop footballs, they're often near their hip like that. Yep, I, I think it would be an inconvenient ball placement would be one way to put it, because you've got a you almost have to turn your bottom hand around and catch it real tight on your hip, and you're running the risk of that ball hitting your hip, the nose of the ball before you're able to close both hands around it. So that's just nice torso mobility to get the shoulders turned and not have to adjust the hands just to torse the, adjust the, the torso. Yeah, and I see, I see receivers get mixed up on this a lot. Sometimes they get confused using the correct hand position or a hand position that they feel comfortable with. Sometimes you'll see them like switch up at the last moment, um, right. like they second-guess their hands, and then they end up losing the ball. But the effort here, I mean, you know, again, that this is this is fluid play. Again, you you know, may not be top end athlete, but you know, the nice dive at the end here. And it's funny, Chad Span was talking to me on Twitter today, talking about, just kind of tweeted me out of the blue and was like talking about this particular drill where you, you know, you dip and rip. Right. And as a drill, and he was like, I he was saying to me, I don't like the dip and rip drill, and like I think that you know it it gives up more of the body than it should be, but it's taught at a lot of ma most major programs, but you know you like the fact that he attacks with it, you know, in this particular play. Well, I think ultimately it's the dip. You're minimizing your surface area at the point of contact. So as long as you're timing it well. Um, it can be effective to collect yourself and also minimize the surface area of a defender has to attack you as a ball carrier. I agree, and I think that that's and as Chad was describing it, I think he was describing when it's when you're not able to time it well, or when there's a situation where you you need to be able to diagnose that it's not going to no matter what you do you're going to be exposing more of your back and neck than you are actually right. getting the effectiveness out of it. And I think it, he, where he was coming from to represent him correctly is you, you, you have to really know how to diagnose when to use that. And I think that Williams does that well here. Right. It's not a one-size-fit-all uh, way to attack tacklers in the open field. Right. This is a play where if we were projecting to the NFL, I would almost think this is this could be the type of problematic play where he gets hit first and might have gotten shed a lot faster in the NFL. Right, right. This is a um, adequate college block, um, but he really does not have the leverage. If he's really utilizing his hands with power, uh, that right hand is really stunning and coming up through the uh, the inside shoulder of that defender right there. He should be able to extend and lift that and really help facilitate more turn and turn that defender all the way out through, whereas he just kind of gets square, but he, he can't finish this block. Yeah, and he actually gets knocked back at when he tries to push, and he's knocked back a little bit or knocked off balance backwards Right. right there. 
And that's where I think a defender with heavy hands in this situation might have knocked him down or thrown him aside right away. And in the NFL, that might have been the difference between this being a touchdown and being a three-yard gain. Because if he's getting picked up in this scenario, uh, it, realistically he could have been driven back into the path of the ball carrier and then the whole play is just bottled up. Yeah. Now that was nice. And that was full speed, too. Uh, there was no really delay there. I think the defender did him a little bit of a favor by running down with the yeah. angle that he took. But, I mean, that's a nice job from Williams. You saw on the point of contact, the feet were fairly wide, so he wasn't going to spin off of this block. I mean, right there, that's... Yeah. You're going to have to go through, through one leg, whether you're going inside or outside, you're going to have to go through a body part to shed this block. Yep, and with the feet on the ground, he's able to punch and generate enough to, to turn this man. But we're also talking about a, a defensive back-sized player, you know, right. in the NFL. So, again, that's who his targets are likely to be if you're scheming for success with Williams as a blocker. Again, this is consistent. Nice turns, nice jobs getting square, and setting up this type of play. Yeah, and the angle. You mentioned last game that we looked at, the angle that he takes initially. He's running to a spot where he can allow flow to set him up for the block as compared to running a little bit more linear down the field, and then he's running the risk of that defender being able to cross his face. Yeah. That's good vision. It's just very good open field vision for a player without the ball. So I like your cat because, see, I mean, I... <laughs> he is, he like is I got even bored. nowhere near the talker that he is tonight, so I hope everybody that's listening is... Uh, enjoying whatever he has to say on the matter. Yeah, he's putting a show on right now, I'm telling you. He's my a showman. Old, my old buddy Bob Harris with uh, Football Diehards would be very happy right now. He's a... All right, and this is just a tough play for any, you know, as you mentioned earlier in, in the other game that we set up here, these flats like this. Yeah, when your head's around and you've already got a guy chopping on your thighs, there's not a whole lot that you can do. No. Um, it would take a special athletic play to be able to absorb that hit and still sustain upfield momentum. Absolutely. This is where you, you know, this is where you're going to see the power. You know, get down, get downfield, and just drive, and you drag this man about four or five yards. Yep. And a lot of this is momentum based. That's what's nice about a crossing route. You get some momentum going. You're able to bend a corner just enough without slowing down, and that's what's going to happen. Let physics take over from there. Oh, and it's amazing what happens when you're able to be hit in stride, where you don't have to break stride and really open up into a run after the catch like this. Yep. And these are the little things that offensive, you know, offensive coordinators are looking for when they're trying to, uh, you know, dev devise a scheme for a player. You know, they're, they're thinking about what's the best way to maximize his usage. Um, you, at least good offensive plays are going to be set up in that sense. Now that's nice. Yep, that was, uh, I set myself up for that special athletic play with a guy chopping on you early while you're turning up field. Um, this is, <laughs> it's great balance, and he's able to have just enough burst after he gets the ball in his hands to get, you know, that defender trailing just enough so that when his momentum uh, hits on impact, 
his lower half swings out away and he's able to peel off the tackle. Absolutely, but I wouldn't indict yourself too much here because the difference between this defender hitting and the last defender, the last defender was at his knees across his hip, very low at his at Williams base. This one's a, a high hit at the shoulder. That's a good point, yeah. You know, so I mean really twenty five needs to be indicted a little bit on this. I mean he thinks he's gonna he thinks he's gonna get him hitting high. And you know, when you drive like that you get the hips leaning and you got the pad lo- the pad level leaning across, you're gonna be able to do what you just did. Just nice effort though. Yep. Now that's nice too. I mean, this is a play I believe where you're going to see hand work on two consecutive players in succession to get open here. You got a little bit of a move yep. with that inside arm to rip up, and then you're chopping down on the next player. And his head's around as soon as he gets over top. Yes. And this to me is this is the type of play. To me, I, I don't know if I'd call this a wild play, but this is a play that definitely gets my attention. Whenever I see a player have to do things in consecutive or in succession like this, like different types of movements, um, show a, vari- a different type of vocabulary, and then the awareness to be ready for the next step, like just a little bit ahead of time and that fluid, that tells you how comfortable a guy can be on the field. One, two, Heads three. Around. Yeah. And I'm sure as he's working up the field, he's recognizing, okay, that the perimeter receiver has run off the overtop coverage. So he knows he's got a soft spot. And as long as he's able to get over top of this defender he's impacted right now, uh, he knows he's got a large cushion to work with. Great point. And he's turning back to say, look, throw it to me. I'm open. Boom. Boom. And here's here. This is my least favorite play for a tight end, because <laughs> <laughs> ever since I see Ben Troop do it back in the day with at right. Florida and with the Titans, and never seemed to be able to hit it. But in this case, yeah, there's not there's not too many tight ends that um, give them or are able to athletically follow up with their belief that they can pull off this hurdle not once but twice. Yeah. This was a this is this is just a fun play. Mm. Yep, and it's fun because also you wonder if he, you know, some guys try to leap way too high, and I don't know whether this was because he couldn't leap higher or because he knew just how much he needed to leap, like that right there. Right. Well, and even that little flutter kick he almost seems to give. He's not trying to um, bullfrog leap over him. He he takes one leg at a time, and he makes sure he's looking down, and he, he pulls the trail leg up and clears the back leg. So I, I think some of it is just you know the speed of which he's doing things is slow enough for him that he's able to process some of these things. Yeah. The speed on this is just... I just love... I love seeing everything about this play. I mean, this is probably one of my favorite plays head to toe because, again, he's thinking that half step ahead with every single move. And he's got the ball under his left arm on the outside. Absolutely. The little things. Yep. And those little things make such a huge difference at every level of every level of the game. I was in inter- just before the show I was interviewing a former Florida State point guard who was one of the top 20 point guards recruited the year that he came to Florida State and injuries pretty much kind of took his career out but he was a player that Bob Gibbons once labeled um, a very you know highly rated um, recruit and he was a, he was voted sleeper of the Nike camp when he was playing Jason Williams over at Duke back in the day and um, you know, when he got injured, he just talked about, you know, the little things that you see and know you can do in your mind's eye, but you have to be able to practice and refine um, and be able to be on the court or on the field to do on a consistent basis. And that's where that little extra bit of work comes in, because otherwise, you, you know, you may see it, but you might not be able to execute it. Right. It's one thing to be able to 
you know, even if it's uh, a pass rush counter as a as, as an edge player, it's one thing to be able to utilize those moves and do them clean uh, in a drill in practice, but to have the speed of the game be slow enough that you can operate your primary responsibility and then utilize those types of next level moves is what I think really separates some of the uh, more special talented players from players who you know are adequate at what they do but might not be top tier yeah now, I like the effort there on a cut like this I mean it's not a it's not a great cut but I love the fact that he is willing to throw himself again into the play and it does the job and golden gets gets down there pretty quickly too so it's okay what can I do to stop this momentum here yeah, he he's turned he's turned the corner and he's coming down a million miles an hour. So, uh, just to get after the legs just enough is able to spring him. Yeah, I mean that's a five yard gain on a play that could have easily been a one yard loss or no gain. So we're, it looks like we're probably not going to see a lot from a route standpoint with him. Um, on a lot of different things, but what are some things that you've noticed from watching his tape that you feel like he does well as a route runner that we haven't seen and things that you feel like he needs to be able to do? I think he does a really nice job um, carrying his speed through uh, some of his breaks, and he recognizes when he has space uh, to be able to you know, maybe not cut some of his breaks at a particularly steep angle, but more importantly, be able to carry through into an open area uh, with speed so that the timing of the play is not necessarily disrupted. Um, I don't. That's not a play where he's really going to win um, against off coverage, having to stick his foot in the ground and come back on a uh, stick pattern or something like that. Um, so I don't know how many of these I'm asking him to do. Yeah. But... But, I mean, we've seen it a couple times when he's flexed in the slot and he's running a speed out and he's able to hit uh, 8 and be rounded off and be heading towards the sideline at 11 or 12. Uh, those are plays that I think really stand out as if you don't put a body on him, he can make a killing there. Yeah. And for him, I mean, these are little things he may have to improve. Say he ends up in a place like Atlanta. Now, Kyle Shanahan's offense is different than Dirk Cutter's, but if he was in a Dirk Cutter offense from based on last year, he would be running a lot of these probably patterns in, in Cutter's offense. And, you know, you'd be looking at a player where he's probably going to – the pads can't come up this early. Right. You would need him to keep the pads down. And then, you know, enough of the – the turn is in, the turn could be a little better, but it's still pretty quick, and maybe attacking, you know, attacking Coming back. back down, come back downhill towards the ball. Yeah. So I mean, some thing. These are little things that, you know, he's going to have to get a little bit better at. But, but again, there's that you know, speed route. You know, yeah. it, it, he's he doesn't have a body on him, so he doesn't have to make a ninety degree cut. That's a pretty nice hip angle right there. Uh, with that foot that he's sticking in the ground as he's whipping his head around and getting shoulders into the sideline. Absolutely. And you can see the lean there in terms of where he's coming out of here. He's coming out of this at a pretty fast clip. And I think that's a good contrast between what he does well and what he doesn't. Like you said, is the speed cut versus a, a you know kind of more of a stick. And these little double moves on vertical routes is where he does well. Because like you said, carrying the momentum through the play, I love how you talk, or through the route like that. And he sells that little nod to the inside with the head fake yep. without losing any speed. Now this one he tips off. Yeah. You know, uh, you can see it right here and you can see this well, he's already minus. he's already breaking so that that might just be down and distance recognition with you know maybe they have a film study where they say okay if they come out flexed in a long passing situation you know they're just going to try and get some of the yardage back and get back to third and maybe nine or ten yeah. um, so I mean, that's a nice heads up play from the defender to really close down on that really quick 
Yeah, and that's a good that's a very good observation. Absolutely, cuz it could definitely be that. <laughs> I like watching I like watching blocks like this only because I, I kind of call it like pulling the pulling the um, breaking the glass on the fire extinguisher. <laughs> what are you like gonna do when everything goes wrong? Type yes, thing. exactly. Like I just want to see what kind of moves you have in your repertoire when you go like uh, breaking in, in case of emergency, break glass, and that's his <laughs> in this play. Offensive linemen, you see it a lot. They seem to have these little moves in their repertoire, like, I'm beat, but I have to do something here. Yep, I can't give up a free run. Yeah. I got another move up top here. All right. It's so really physical on the release. That was, that was nice. You know, he's not held up. Uh, he's not disrupted. You can see he essentially runs right through the press. Yep. A little bit better place ball, and that's that's a touchdown. That's a perfect point about the place ball because he's in he's in stride in stride. Now he has to stop and lean back into the into the defender. If that ball was placed where it was before and the in the previous game, we would have had a different story here. Yep. So. Absolutely good, good, good stuff. So, uh, with that in mind, I mean, is there any player when you when you watch him? Where would you like to see Max Williams when you've been? If you if you had time to think about like where would you like to see him play in the NFL? Like, who are some of the teams that come to mind for you? I think if you can get him somewhere, um, I don't know if I have a specific team in mind, but somewhere that is willing to move him around and feature him in the middle of the field, whether it's vertically on seams or as an H-back. I think he does well enough there in the blocking department that he can be adequate with upside to develop into a little bit more of a traditional player. Uh, so somewhere that needs a receiving target that they'll, they're willing to play immediately and be creative to keep him on the field until he develops into what he has the potential to be. I think that's a good. I think that's a good way of putting it. I mean, I would think a team like Atlanta might not be bad in a Kyle Shanahan offense if they're looking at using more of an H back type of player because they certainly had success with Reed, um, right? You know, in that capacity. And I think we all know that Reed was not the was not even as good of a blocker <laughs> as as Williams yeah. was yeah. when Reed came out of school. So. You know, or the fact that they're using Niles Paul sometimes in those positions, so that could be a that could be a nice fit, especially when you have a guy like Toy Lolo who is a very good blocker, but not much as a as a downfield threat as a receiver. Right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, certainly, you know, that's a good point about what we need to see with him come to mind. But uh, you know, this was definitely a good show, and I, I'm looking forward to having you back. And I don't want to take too much more time out of your birthday. I know you you got to be having more fun doing something other than this. Although this was a blast, but you know, I mean, come on now. You know, 26 years old. You don't want to spend it with an old man like me. So, um, you know, for for Kyle Krabs, I'm Matt Waldman. This was the RSP Film Room. And thanks again for watching, and you guys have a good night. <laughs>